I'll talk like this. Will you? Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Or I don't want to stand over here. I want to stand over here. Take it with. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. You guys haven't used this before. But yeah. Love Apple, it's so much easier if you want to share photos. I'll introduce you. Are we good? Hello. Good afternoon. Everybody sit down all right get started yes something thank you in the back i'm looking at the powder mountain table <clears throat> i'm kidding all right oh as many of you know who have been here before this is our B Street lecture series put on by Augustinch. Um, I know it's a clever name. You can tell all of us Ogden Avalanche are creatives. We named it the lecture series. Anyone that goes to lectures for fun, I do. Uh, so we've been doing this for five years. So that's pretty cool. I know you've been to every one. Oh, Nick Dye, yeah. Yeah, I think I even will. This is my first one. This is Han time, so he's a virgin. Oh, um, now I'm off. But this, so uh, the return of Hungover Friday, folks at the ski areas. So don't get Fridays, because most of your ski patrollers are over. Um, anyway, without further ado, Hans is going to talk about accidents and factors to kick off this fifth year, and it's a five-part series, so we'll see you for the four Thursdays after this. Cool. Hans. Hey, guys. Welcome to the, uh, skiing today. Yes, it is good, and it's going to get better. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about the snow. I'm going to talk about on some of the accidents that have happened, some recent uh, I'm going to talk about my evolution in snow and snow science and avalanche forecasting and tell you a few stories, um, hopefully learn and uh, see some videos of some pretty cool places um, around the world that I was lucky enough to visit and be a part of. But the place I love most is right here, Ogden, Utah. Amazing place. Best snow in the world, um, as and you can see from right here, it's snowing right now. Uh, up at Snow Basin, 
uh, we've gotten 40 inches and two inches of SWE over the past week, 20 and about one inches of SWE. And what do you guys got up there at powder? About the same? Yeah, how much snow have you guys gotten? About 40 inches the past week? Yes. And it's only going to get better, okay? It's only going to get better. My audio skills aren't that – or my video skills aren't that awesome. I'm going to show you some things that I like to look at in the mornings. And uh, for many of you people that live here in Utah, we're lucky. We have the University of Utah, um, and they, they have created these plumes, which we really like looking at. Uh, sexy plumes here. You can see – Water and snow equivalent right here. So the water is the top one, and that is showing snow basin. And I'm sorry, I'm just focusing on snow basin because that's where my bookmarks are. Uh, up to five inches of water through this storm. Um, that's looking good. I usually under underreport that. I don't believe the higher ends. I usually drop off 20%. But we're definitely looking over another 50 inches coming up. So that's really, really good. Um, so recently at Snow Basin, over the weekend, we had about 15 inches and we were able to open some terrain. Um, and you know, we do it piece by piece and we have gates, we close gates, we open gates this weekend. Um, we decided we weren't able to get the tram open. So we kept no name closed, but we opened, uh, up on Monday some terrain into no name and we did have an event and we had someone go out of bounds and enter um into our hell's canyon area and i'll show you a photo of that right here and this event um pretty good pretty good photo of hell's canyon do we have a pointer or anything like that uh, what's that okay fingers good up here this ridge, if you follow it all the way up, that's our ski area boundary. And people like to go into the upper zones there and ski some really good terrain. You can see it's all avalanche terrain and it funnels down into here. Um, we call this area the cemetery. Unfortunately, we've had several deaths over the past 26 years that this uh, terrain has been easily accessible from people. Um, so on Monday, people went out of bounds and were traversing the upper start zones and getting closer and closer to the sweet spot. And I'll show you here. So this is that upper spot up top there. You can see the avalanche right here. A lot of people were traversing over and going into the trees. And our one snowboarder decided to go a little bit further. And we don't know if he was heading towards the trees or where he was going, but he triggered an avalanche at the top of the slide path and went for a fairly large and significant slide. This area had slid earlier in the season. Uh, we had a persistent weak layer problem that got uh, taken out. Uh, in early December, and we had uh, 55 inches with seven inches of water that took out our persistent weak layer, but 27 days of drought came through after that, and then this first storm sort of got people excited about going straight into the backcountry again, um, and unfortunately, this individual kicked off a major slide. One of our guests saw a powder cloud and uh, alerted at the ski patrol and so we were unsure if there was someone in there so we decided to close our gates and that's what we do we do due diligence we close our terrain so that our workers don't get caught in there if there it happens to be a rescue um and uh we had a uac forecaster along with our head um ski area uh ski patroller Corey Cruzy for the day, they were up there and they looked at it and they noticed that there was only one track going in and no track going out. So um, due diligence, closed the terrain. Uh, we called a helicopter in and we looked at it and fortunately uh, through the helicopter and looking out the window, uh, we noticed that the individual that created this slide 
had arrested on the bed surface and was able to get out, which is a very, very, very good outcome. So that happened on this past Monday. Um, so yeah, so this talks about accidents and things that happen. And I'd like to just share with you some of my personal experiences um, over the years, my evolution into ski patrolling. Uh, I call myself a snow enthusiast and I'm sort of like a ski bum um, disguised as a ski patroller, I guess. But uh, I started in Colorado at a little place called Eldora. And I, I don't know anybody who's ever been there, anybody skied over there? Yeah? Small hill, pretty fun. Yeah, so for you guys that haven't been there, it's continental. It's on the uh, western slope of uh, the Rockies or eastern slope of the Rockies. So it's high, it's cold, and it gets it has a rain shadow, snow shadow. So it doesn't get nearly as much snow as a lot of other areas. Um, it's close to Boulder, which is a bonus because it's a party town. Um, very, very windy place. One of the lowest places in the Continental Divide is Rollins Pass. It's right there. And the winds just funnel right through there. Um, great place to, to learn as a ski patroller. Small. Doesn't have a huge amount of avalanche terrain, but it does have a little bit of terrain. And uh, so I started my ski, ski patrol um, path there as a volunteer my first year and got my skills up, sort of dealing with people that get hurt. Um, and a lot of people come from Kansas and Nebraska in jeans and try and ski those slopes and they're pretty icy. Uh, but a guy named Matt Phillips, he was a ski patroller friend of mine. Uh, he'd worked at Berthoud as a snow safety director and he liked backcountry skiing. So he uh, took me under his wing and he took me outside the scary boundary for my first really ever experience out in the, in, uh, in the backcountry side country. And uh, we started going through the trees, having a really good time. And he stopped, he said, okay, now it's time to put on the beacon. And I'm like, beacon, what the hell is that? Um, so he put it on or gave it to me, I put it on. And I'm like, okay, so what's the deal? I don't know how to use this. He's like, that's okay, I know how to use it. And I'm like, so what's the deal? He's like, you go first. I'm like, I get to go first. This is the best thing ever, right? So we went and skied Lost Lake Headwall, fun little zone, went down. And, uh, you know, I was like, this is unbelievable. But uh, being a skier that likes to push the boundaries and have fun, you know, a few days later, it was a day off. I went skiing. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back out there. And I didn't have a beacon. I didn't have a partner. I didn't have anything other than just the memory of having a really good time out there. And uh, I was deciding, you know, I'm not going to hit that steep shot that we went into, but I will ski around it. Went in there, great, great skiing, fun time. Um, probably did two or three laps. The next day, I went in there again. There was only one difference. There was just a little bit of wind. I came in there, skied through the trees, came to a pitch, and then there was a three-foot crown and a, probably a D two and a half, three. Um, that had crossed a lake that I was going to cross myself. And I was like, holy shit, what's going on here? You know, I, I didn't know anything. The only thing I knew that the skiing was a little different. Then I did a little bit of research and I found out that that was an active avalanche path. And a few years earlier, a snowshoer had died in that area. So that was sort of my come to Jesus moment. It's like, okay, what am I doing? Why am I in the backcountry? What do I need to do to get some skills? So I decided um, to take a course and do what a lot of people do, get a course and have some fun in the backcountry. Um, and the next thing I did was I became a pro at spending time learning about the skills. Uh, and the skills I learned at Eldora were fairly minimal. Um, I mean, the terrain, the mountains there are huge. Uh, I think the safest time to go ski in is in the spring when you get a nice track, it gets kind of warm again, then it freezes, then that's your chance to go and hit some of the bigger lines that they have out there. Um, so I was in the front range for four years and then I came here to Utah and started patrolling at Snow Basin when they put in the new lifts and that's uh, 25, 26 years ago. 
They put in the gondolas, the high-speed quad, and the tram, opening up the terrain into Strawberry and into No Name, into some pretty significant avalanche terrain. And uh, that first year was a drought. We had something similar to what we have right now. It was very, very dry. The snowpack, there was only snow at about 7,500 feet and above. The whole valley was dry. And we didn't open Snow Basin until mid-January. Um, first storm was sort of similar to what we're seeing right now. Very, very large, three, four, five feet. Um, all of us rookies, because Snow Basin had uh, expanded, they decided to hire 20 people that year. And so we had 20 brand new rookies at a place like Snow Basin trying to mitigate and learn about avalanche or uh, about avalanches. So um, my first ever route, I was with a guy named Mike Hansen shooting cracks, avalanches. I'm like, what the hell are we doing here? Um, traversing onto 28 degree slopes, cracks. Um, we threw one shot in a place called Powder Hound Bowl and uh, my partner kick turned and then the avalanche was about four feet deep and took out the shot and went down into the bottom of the bowl and then went off. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, if that kick turn had kicked off the slide and he had gotten caught in it, he would have been in the avalanche with that bomb going off. Um, two days later, I was lucky enough to go up onto No Name, or excuse me, uh, John Paul, and that was going to be the first ever control work in that terrain for the first time. Um, operationally, there was four of us. Um, guy that we all know, you guys at Powder Mountain love him, Marcus Waite was there, Mike Hansen, and Tom Leonard. Tom Leonard was the patrol director at the time, and uh, awesome guy, and pretty smart. And I'd never been on a route with Tom before. Uh, we got into some flats, and we threw our first shot. Um, I saw Tom walk over, or ski over, and grab a tree. And I was like, uh, I think I should go grab a tree. Um, that shot went off and, uh, we were, we were on the flats. We didn't see much. He sort of threw it as far as he could into the woods. And, um, uh, then we heard on the radio, what the hell are you guys doing up there? The triangles are going, which are the men's and women's downhills. JP face is going. Patrol shoots are going. So that one shot, that first day, there was probably a connected 700 or 800 meter or more um, crown that went around the mountain. And uh, it was extremely destructive. Um, and that was my sort of intro to Avalanche World at Snow Basin. Uh, pretty unbelievable. Really lucky to be there at that time, but super dangerous. And I just sort of just like, oh my God, what have I got myself into? Um, so that was that was an amazing time. And we did have a lot of gates back then, and we closed a lot of terrain a lot of the time. Um, I can't remember who I was talking to. Was it Corey? Uh, we would have to close John Paul lift because we didn't have enough skiers back in the day. It would snow so hard that we would actually get avalanches. Patrollers were going out the door skiing as much as much and as fast as they could creating slides, but we couldn't keep on top of it. So we had to close terrain uh, because of that. So um, because I really enjoyed skiing and I enjoyed learning about snow, we have an exchange program with Turoa in New Zealand. And um, I was really fortunate enough to be part of that. So I went to New Zealand and uh, started that that first year. So I was doing Never Summers in 1999. Um, got over there and I was like, what is this mountain I'm getting myself into? So I, my next mountain I worked at was Turo and I'll tell you about the weather there and the, the snowpack. Um, it's about a 3000 meter peak on the North Island of New Zealand. And it just is a weather magnet. It just creates weather, grabs weather, and it gets a lot of wind. Um, it's unbelievably unforgiving and it is, uh, really icy rime ice comes in there and grabs it and just you will get overnight you can get literally feet of rime ice on um on lifts and it also makes incredibly hard bed surfaces 
that are like um, like panes of glass, and it's a continental snowpack, or excuse me, maritime snowpack. So you'll get weeks of storm sometime that'll shut things down for seven, eight, ten days. And many of you guys may have seen this, but I have an uh, an avalanche from um, my third or fourth year there where we were heli bombing, and it's one of the larger avalanches. You know, I thought I'd seen avalanches in Utah, but then uh, getting up on that mountain unbelievable sizes of avalanches with huge consequences. So let's see if I can find that here. Well, I might have to describe it but I and show it here before this is uh, over. You can't see it on my screen. All right, I can't screen, sorry. So we threw that shot at the summit there. Um, that first avalanche stepped down, that would have taken and killed everybody in here. So this is, this avalanche goes on for five minutes. So it starts off as a basic slash and goes into almost like a lahar. At the, it just runs for almost, you can see these cliffs right there. It, you know, it'll take, crowns were uh, over 16 feet high. And the connection of the top of it was over one kilometer wide. So it just keeps going. That's uh, 5,000 vert. Where is this located? Uh, the North Island of uh, New Zealand on Mount Rupehu, two rows. This is, uh, yeah, the glacier run that we call. So I was the, uh, I was lucky enough to be the steer on this run. Um, my snow safety, Murray Brown, threw the shot. And then um, Denim Stewart, he's like, you know what? I think I'll just bring a camera. And so that's why we have it on video here. So Kiwis are crazy, let me tell you that much. It snows two to five centimeters, and they are flinging themselves off cliffs. Um, and they also disregard all avalanche warnings. So unfortunately, lots of the times we have to close the terrain. Um, the North Island, where I was here, um, Wellington and Auckland are the closest big cities, and Mount Rupe, who's right in the middle. It's um, got three ski fields. Wakapapa, Turoa, and Takino, and uh, you can tra traverse from one to the other. Um, but the North Island party crew likes to go there. They like to go crazy at night, party because the uh, bars stay open until four o'clock in the morning. So you'll see them. Um, if you're there, you'll see them at four, but you'll see them in line with a Red Bull and vodka or whatever, ready to go, and then they'll fling themselves off cliffs. So I saw the biggest avalanches of my life at Mount Rupehu and had a little bit more respect for snow because of that. Um, working at Snow Basin, I also had the opportunity to go to Gulmarg in India. And uh, I'll show some uh, footage from there. But uh, Gulmarg in India, 
is a ski area that goes, um, it has the highest gondola in the world, goes to about 13.5, and uh, it's in Kashmir. So it's in sort of disputed area of uh, India. Pakistan is on the other side. It's got um, the line of control, which is basically the Pakistani army there and the Indian army. Um, and they are looking at each other with bunkers and they've got machine guns and uh, they happen to have a ski area there. And you are greeted at the bottom of the lift with guys with machine guns. You get off at the top and you get off and you get on a ridge and there's other guys with machine guns. And you look over and you can see the Pakistanis looking back, pointing their guns at you. And all you wanna do is ski. Um, it's an incredible place um, with huge, huge, incredible backcountry terrain and good, good snow. I would compare it to what we have here. So I was there for one season, um, 1995-ish, and I shared the job of snow safety director with two other guys, one guy from um, California and another guy from the Ruby Mountains. And we went there to sort of run their upper mountain, which had never been open before. They used it for tourists only, and they decided that it was uh, time to open it to skiers. So they hired us to go check it out and uh, see what it was like. That year, um, similar conditions to actually now, persistent weak layer, uh, is there a theme here? Um, and when I got there, um, so there was three of us. The first guy was there for Christmas. He got to ski the first snow of the year, it was pretty good. Then it was a drought for almost five, six weeks, and then it started snowing again right before I got there. Um, the day I got there, they had a backcountry avalanche fatality, and um, I was sort of handed the reins. Okay, here you go. This is your ski area to run. Um, they didn't have any explosives, and you had huge amount of terrain to cover. Um, my luggage got lost in Delhi Airport, so I showed up at the ski area, and uh, I didn't have my skis or my boots, and I had a ski area to sort of take care of. I was like, what, what is going on here? So I went to the rental shop and I got a pair of um, 1980 rear entry boots and a local guide had some Seth pistols and he said, here you go. And I'm like, okay, I'll go up on the mountain and check it out. There was one Kiwi that was there from one of the club fields and he was sort of there to help us out and teach us the things. She's like sort of the handover. Um, he was sick with deli belly, so he couldn't get up there. So I had to go up and sort of check out the terrain for myself. And I decided to go down the ridge, the safest ridge I possibly could. And uh, as we were going, I wanted to look at the avalanche that had happened at where that individual had passed away. But as we were going down, we had some wind slabs. And I was like, oh, you know, I'll just go do some wind slab hunting with these guys. Um, and I was with three other Indians, Kashmiris. And as we went down near the bottom, I made one turn and I heard like, clapping from these guys and um i had kicked off a hard slab d2 ish but it ran several thousand feet down and that was my sort of intro to what's going on in india um we tried to use explosives we tried to get the indian government to help us out but they would not so we had a cornice at the top that we'd pry up and try and get big balls of uh snow to go down big cornices to create avalanches um, I do have a video here that'll show you of um, the terrain in India and an avalanche that happened. And my friend Brian Newman, who I worked with at Eldora uh, and Snow Basin, he is now the avalanche forecaster for this ski area. So you can see the debris here. And then we'll see, it's all avalanche path. The whole ski area is a massive, incredible avalanche path. You see the symp sympathetic.
So the Indian Army base is just off the ridge to the top there. And uh, two years after I was there working, they were training in the flats, four and a half, 5,000 vertical feet down in the trees. And an avalanche came through there and um, took out 15 army um, guys. And after that, they decided that it was time to maybe let the guys that were going to be the snow safety people use explosives. And so unlike what we use at the mountains here, they get to use plastic explosive and put it together and throw it. And they have military guys and they had military guys go with them for the first year or two. Um, they decided, yeah, this is kind of crazy. We'll just let you guys have the explosives and go and use it. And so Brian has been there ever since, and he's their snow safety director. Um, I also am lucky enough to work in the Ruby Mountains of uh, Nevada. Um, and the Rubies, even though they're halfway between here and California, they have more of a continental snowpack. Um, high altitude, seven peaks over 11,000 feet. Um, and they don't get nearly as much snow as we do. Um, but they do get more and more um, snowmobilers as their um, active users. So you've got uh, people in the back country there um, using snowmobiles and they can get anywhere really, really fast. And uh, in recent times, they're starting to get themselves into a lot of trouble. And we're watching people going into wilderness areas, not caring about things. It is Nevada after all, so people feel like they can do whatever the hell they want. and. Uh, you know, they get on their snowmobiles and they get in trouble. Um, while I was there in, while I've been there working, I've had a cl close call with a, uh, with clients in the back country and, um, our, I guess our morning meetings and our discussions and just following protocol saved us that day. So I'm going to show you a video of a piece of terrain that um, we had some guests caught in that I was there to, to be a part of. Can't see it from here. All right, here we go. This is, this is Cherry right here. So we ski a lot of the times where that far avalanche is down through these cliffs and then out. And there's a reef right here of rocks. That's a trigger point usually. So a fairly large avalanche, continental snowpack. Um, So when I was there um, several years ago, we were skiing this piece of terrain and I was the third group in there and the group in front of me was itching to go. And this one guy said, hey, I wanna just join my friends up top. I'm like, what did your guide say? He said, well, I should just stick here. I'm like, well, the deal is we're doing one run, one person at a time on this slope. And he's like, come on, I wanna go. I'm like, Once, one guy at a time, uh, that's the deal. And um, we heard avalanche, avalanche, avalanche on the radio. And the guy before him had skied closest to that reef right there and skied a little bit too far, stepped onto a weak spot and had the whole thing go. And it was very similar to that video that you just saw. So um, I think I'd been patrolling for maybe 15 years at the time. And it was the first time I had to use my beacon to go into debris and actually look for someone. Um, it was like, holy shit, this is real. Uh, went out there, the guy, um, there was one guy, I didn't know how many there was because I couldn't see them from the top. I assumed that there was more people buried because of the size of it. And it was the classic, the guy was yelling, dig me up, dig me up, dig me up. And I'm like, no, dude, you're breathing, you're fine. So I just kept going down and looking to the toe because I want to do my due diligence to make sure that no one was, else was in there. 
Um, that brings me to another zone, Craigie Burn. Um, so we have some people here that just visited Craigie Burn for the first time and had a pretty good time. Yeah. We've got Sierra in the house. She worked there this year with me as a ski patroller. So um, the terrain in New Zealand there at Craigie Burn, it's on the South Island. So it's another range. Um, beautiful, beautiful range outside of Christchurch. And it's very, very steep and a lot of avalanche terrain it unfortunately um, lives in global warming land like we all sort of seem to um, it gets a little bit of rain um, and it is known to get massive avalanches and massive storms from the northwest lots of wind um, it is basically a maritime um, environment and um, it is pretty pretty special um, skiing the club fields in New Zealand is like going back in time and working in a ski museum. Um, you know, you come to these ski areas here and everything is pretty much, you know, get on a lift. Someone else has done things for you there. You do everything yourself, uh, rope toes and tractors. And, uh, that's how you, you get up the hill. So there is most of these ski areas have tractors. Um, a lot of them have been electrified, but uh, the one at Craigie Burn, the one at place I work at, actually is a 1954 tractor that you have to sit on, put it in gear, and start it. Um, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty awesome. You only have three patrollers on a day, um, and you've got a lot, a lot of really cool terrain. The um, problem with it is, you know, it's 85%, 90% avalanche terrain. Um, the good thing is it's a maritime climate, so usually things settle out pretty quickly. So I'll show you a little video that one of our patrollers took uh, a few years ago, just to give you an idea of what the train looks like. Um, and he's sort of the marketing guy and the ski patrollers are the, um, the athletes, shall we say. So just give me a second. So that's the biggest, scariest part of the mountain is that upper bowl right there. That's Hamilton Peak. That's the highest peak that holds the snow the longest and gets the most wind and gets the least amount of skier traffic. That traverse that you can see there, you can ski to it from the top of the lift. Uh, this is the hike that goes between Craigieburn and Broken River. Is Max in here? No. So Max Powder Mountain represents right on the other side is Broken River. Um, I think it's pretty cool. So I work at Snow Basin and uh, Max works at Powder Mountain. And when we're in the Southern Hemisphere, we have two guys that work snow safety right on either side of the ridge down there too. Wild terrain, incredible skiing when it's good. Uh, biggest problem, like I said, is it's 85% uh, avalanche terrain. Uh, the good, best thing about it is, uh, I don't know, how, I think 175 was our biggest day last year. Um, so your skier numbers are very, very small. Skiing, maybe, you know, average 30 to 70 people when it's good. Uh, when you're unlucky, you'll have over 150 people there. Uh, really, really good terrain, fun skiing. Um, but it also takes me to my first ever avalanche route there. I sort of, something happened to me then as well. And I'll show you that after this is over. All right. So this was my first route in at Craigieburn. 
um, went on route and went up to Mount the Hamilton Peak because that's one of our places that we have to check out. And this is Hamish up by the Crown. And I said, I'm going to go down and check out the uh, a good spot for you to throw a shot. And as I went down towards um, a ridge, this medium slab kicked off and went down into the valley. And you can see it goes down all the way down in here. So the avalanche on the left was day one. Uh, day two, we went to clean it up and that avalanche on the right was day two coming into there. Um, down in the Craigieburn range, actually I heard of something that I'd never heard of before, but they actually had two avalanches over the past 20 years um, that were seismic related. Um, a snowcat driver at night um, got caught in an avalanche and he got taken out over one of the cat tracks and taken out. So an avalanche came through at night and they couldn't figure out what it was that triggered this avalanche. And it just so happened that it was a, um, a uh, small earthquake that had happened near Christchurch. And all of us, oh, maybe not all of us, but many of you may, may have realized that, uh, what, two, three years ago, Christchurch had all those earthquakes and it happened, you know, they, for, they had thousands of them. But uh, it is a very, very earthquake prone country with a lot of faults. And uh, that was something that I had never really thought about, that you could be out on the slopes. And if you are in, a, you know, in the terrain, you can, an earthquake can uh, create an avalanche. Uh, so I'm going to finish off here with uh, un the unfortunate problem with ski accidents, uh, and fatalities in ski areas. Um, and many of you know that um, at, Squab at uh, Palisades uh, yesterday on KT22, there was a uh, event that happened uh, half an hour after they opened, they had an avalanche and several people were buried and one person died. I don't have the full details, but the one detail I do know is that it was the first time that they had opened that terrain um, for the season. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to the International Social Science Workshop this fall, and one of the speakers talked about um, ski area accidents and avalanches inbounds. And in the past 20 years, um, all the accidents that have happened have basically happened between opening day and January 20th. And they happen when terrain is opened for the first time. Um, and it usually happens within the first two hours. It can happen immediately, and it can also happen up to three days later. Uh, in Taos, a few years back, there were some people that got caught three days after the avalanche, uh, after the terrain was open. And so I feel for those guys um, at Palisades. There's uh, a lot of avalanche workers in the room here. And it's really, really hard and stressful when you're opening something for the first time because you never know. Um, we do the best we can. We use explosives. We use time. Um, we use air blasts, uh, gut intuition. And sometimes, you know, you put several thousand people on a slope and they're going to find the spot before, you know, they're going to find that spot. And so we, uh, we had an avalanche at Snow Basin. Uh, six years ago, I think, seven. Um, and I was the snow safety guy that was in charge for the day. And we were opening No Name for the first time um, that season. It was a very thin season. Um, and we had kept No Name closed. We were opening terrain around it, but we decided that it wasn't good enough yet to ski and open. And uh, 
in hindsight, obviously, it was a big mistake. And I think we've learned that anytime we can open terrain, we will open it. The skiing may be really shitty, but the best thing we can do is to get people on the snow so that we can, you know, deal with those facets and those problem layers that are in there. So um, we decided to open No Name. And uh, I stood at the gate and I personally high fived every single person that went through that gate and uh there weren't that many of them it was uh marcus was there and uh i went to the top and hung out and i had a meeting to go to and i went down a run called ftg and uh and it's amazing i was having face it was face shots it was amazing i was so stoked i'm like finally we got this piece of terrain open and then my radio went off and said Avalanche, avalanche, avalanche. There's been an avalanche on no name. And I'm like, what the, what? Are you kidding me? Um, and uh, I went to the one likely spot I thought it could be, traversed over uh, through the woods, hard left. And then I did see debris. Um, as things, as these things do happen, we were doing a radio upgrade that day. And my radio was not working at all. So I had to use a cell phone and I was told that there was a definite fully buried person on no name. And I don't know if any of you guys have read the snowy tor torrents or know about them, but you know, it's stories about actual accidents, avalanche accidents that have happened over the years. And I honestly felt I was in the pages of the snowy torrents. I'm like this, I cannot believe is happening. Use your training. What can you do? Um, I saw this massive slide and uh, called on the phone, dispatch. I'm like, this thing goes on forever. Like, do you have any more information for me? Uh, yeah, there's one person that was caught. They're out, but their partner was not. Um, and uh, I came around the corner, looked down, and several hundred meters below me in a gully, I saw a group of people. Um, I skied as quickly as I could down there, and uh, they were probing, looking, and... Um, it was actually, I said, what, you know, does anybody see what happened? They're like, and Marcus said, yeah, man, yeah, man. She's right here, right here. And I'm like, where Marcus point directly where? And as he did that, we we're pulling out our probes. And I think Brent Hadley had his probe, his pole and he was there. He was going like that. And he's like, I think I struck her. And, um, he hit her on the head. And uh, I dove in, like head first into the snow, and got my hands to the victim's um, mouth and opened it up. And the victim at the time was not uh, was blue and almost not breathing. Um, we exc excavated this person, and uh, the first thing I asked was, "Who's the president of the United States?" And it was Trump, and. I was the I was so happy to hear that. Um, she came alive in our arm and basically in front of us, and um, we were able to get her off the snow. And we were very, 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 very fortunate. Uh, training kicked in. We did have a witness, and uh, luckily, you know, anytime there is an avalanche, you have a witness. You go to the last scene point and you work it. Um, those guys were so frazzled when the avalanche came by, they thought for sure that the size of the avalanche had taken this person and took them, taken them down the slope. But we went right back to that spot, last scene's point, started probing, and we were, I don't know, stars aligned, but we were able to get this person out of the snow. Um, and I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. Um, yeah, things happen in snow, um, and we do the best we can, avalanche professionals, to uh, make it safe for all our guests. And uh, for you guys that like to spend time in the backcountry, you know, there's no better time than uh, the present to have fun and learn and do what you can. So I've got a few um, just takeaways um, for those guys. You know, I think that everybody should use ski areas and enjoy getting better at skiing um you know like ski areas are awesome you know people go out of their way they get up at four o'clock in the morning to mitigate hazard so you can go ski and uh 
you know, that's where you should get your, your jumps and all your, like all your crazy stuff out. Cause if you go into the back country, you don't have much of a safety net. You have yourself and your buddies. Um, and on that note, I think that people should just pick really good buddies to go out with and not too many, right. You know, one or two people, you know, once you get into crowds, things start happening. Um, take an avalanche, avalanche class, have good mentors and, um, you know, treat the backcountry with a little bit of respect. I think the biggest problem we have uh, in Utah is the availability of skiing outside ski area boundaries, and people just sort of start taking for granted that they could just jump into steep lines just outside the boundary when it's actually a pretty dangerous place. Um, it's, you know, one turn outside the boundary, and you're totally in the backcountry, a place that hasn't been uh, controlled. Um, and then, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, stick to lower angle slopes. If you're, um, skiing, ski the ski area, ski the steepest stuff there. But if you're going to the back country, you know, there's this really steep slope over there. There's a little mellower slope over there. Pick a little bit lower angle. It's probably going to help you out. And, uh, persistent weak layers. You hear about pers persistent weak layers, you know, there's no reason to go out a day or two after a storm and deal with the beast. Uh, give it time, listen to the forecast, see what people are doing, and uh, stick to ridges. Don't go into uh, gullies. The day of the avalanche that happened a few days ago, um, I was with my cousin here from Denmark, and we were skiing No Name, having a really good time. Got on the shuttle, and there was a guy that's like, oh, man, did you just come out of hells? I'm like, no, I did not. Um, and he's like, oh, it was so good on in there. I'm like, did you stick to ridges? He's like, no, I was down in the in the gully and i just saw someone um and i was like you know that's probably not the most um wise thing to be doing but uh you know people do crazy things and they want to have a good time and i can't blame people for having a good time we all want to have the best time when we're in the mountains skiing and uh enjoying the powder snow that's out there so um yeah, at that point i guess i'm done anybody have any questions any points anybody want to bring anything up or I'm just going to take questions from the group here if you got any. Well, I wasn't going to talk about it, but Corey Davis is really happy that you did. Um, so last year, oh yeah. So last year, uh, I was caught and carried an avalanche and my airbag saved me so the story is um early season ish 13th of december uh doing control work on no name um we were getting a lot of collapsing and a lot of uh decent sized avalanches um we fortunately uh, had had it open a few weeks prior and we were getting skiers in that terrain we did know that the backcountry was pretty, pretty scary and pretty, um, pretty dodgy. We did three laps in there. We put many air blasts. And uh, at one point, I was with my route partner. Um, and uh, we did feel a huge collapse at one point. And I was like, this is just not feeling good. You know, let's go back. Let's throw some more shots. Let's put some more air blasts out there. Um, and we did. Um, uh, we felt good about opening the terrain and we did open no name. Um, it was my day off. So I decided to keep skiing. Um, I did not take my, um, I had not changed back into my civilian clothes. I was still doing a, you know, a few work runs, um, checking out the boundary. I had yet been to the boundary and seeing what was going on there. So, um, I think on my third lap after second lap after control, I went to the boundary line on the lower pyramids. And then I looked down, um, and I saw a guy, a snowboarder out of bounds, uh, go through the trees. And I said to myself, I did a quick, you know what? That guy's going to get caught in an avalanche. And I made a very unfortunate to go follow that person and don't know what i was thinking but uh i think having that 
a no name, um, thinking that, you know, oh yeah, that person, not, it's not going to be me. Uh, held that person down, gave them a little bit of space, came through the woods and I was scanning where, um, and, and next thing I, I was in an avalanche and, uh, uh, it carried me through trees and, uh, I hit several of them. I was completely under from the front. I was on my tele skis and I forward and, uh, I know I was in the wash washroom. I was just, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I had gone into the back just outside the ski area. I was, alone. no one knew I was there. Uh, I was hitting trees. And to the third time I hit a tree, I was like, this is it. I'm, this is it. Um, and uh, I remembered I had my airbag uh, and I pulled. And next thing I know, um, I was on the surface and I couldn't believe that that had just happened to me. Uh, yeah. I mean, none of us want to be in an avalanche, right? Ever. Uh, but the thing that went through my mind is, you know, you know, I've got two kids, a great family. Um, and here I am, this is, this could be it. Right. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, uh, I was on my knees and I got up from that when the avalanche happened and, uh, I saw that the one track from the snowboard had actually been taken out by the avalanche. And, um, I assume that our, um, guest never actually knew that it happened. And I just had made a terrible mistake. I could have actually created the avalanche to have taken him out too. Um, but it was just a split, a split second decision that really, really was absolutely could have been, you know, the worst consequence ever. I could have been a statistic and not been up here able to share some stories with you guys. So that's what happened to me last year. Um, no name, um, pyramids area. More, more questions? <laughs> Thanks guys. Corey, you got anything? What would I do differently? Um, I, I would have called dispatch and I would have said, Hey, dispatch, there's a guy that's out here. I'm going to keep an eye on him. I'm going to stick on the Ridge. Um, that's what I would have done differently. Uh, you know, I mean, I had a radio, I had all the rescue gear and, uh, I didn't like, I just made a decision to go out there. Um, it was not the right decision. Um, you know, we follow protocols. I think, you know, we had that incident that happened just on Monday and we sort of took a step back. We don't go quickly into terrain when we're not involved. You know, had it been um, a friend of mine, someone I knew, I would have done maybe the same thing. I would have yelled at him. I would have, I don't know, you know, but it was, uh, it was absolutely, ins I, at one point I was like, I'm not looking out after myself. I'm looking forward, looking away and having more self-awareness, I think is, you know, obviously a huge thing. Uh, last year on the last storm cycle in April, um, it started getting warm and, uh, we were the last day strawberry was open for the season. We were all going to go sort of celebrate up on the Moise peak. And I was hiking up and I was like looking on the backside towards Ogden and I saw this huge avalanche and the UAC had been talking about, you know, the isothermic slides that could go. And this thing was, you know, it went maybe 2000 vertical feet and was several hundred feet wide, uh, maybe two or three feet deep. And we looked out there and we saw tracks going towards this crown. And, uh, we're like, where, what, what's going on? And we decided to slow roll that 
and say, hey, no one called us. We don't know what's going on. They could have kicked it off and then gotten out of that. Um, I tried to get a helicopter to go look. And so what we did was we just stood on the ridge and we looked down with binoculars and, you know, didn't see anything whatsoever. And it was way out in the back country, um, far away from the ski area. And uh, we did find out later that the individuals that uh, had put in those tracks, that they actually did it the day before. They went right to where the crown was. And then they had a bad feeling. And they said, you know what? We're going to get out of this. And then they hiked out. And that's why it was weird tracks. We didn't, it just didn't make any sense to us. Um, but for us as rescuers, you know, we weren't going to jump in there without having some credible witness, someone seeing what was going on. So that that's one of the stories from, you know, just the last cycle from last year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I this year um, we, as a group, have really been pushing, trying to keep terrain skied harder, um, and like pushing to do that. Um, maybe something that I think about a little bit more personally. You know, I haven't been. Um, I mean, we've been doing control work all the time today. You know, I made a decision not to open something because I had a bad feeling. I was like, you know what? There's no reason to be putting, I mean, we, we got really good skiing right now. You know, let's do it in stages a little bit more. So personally, I'm like, I'm thinking there's skiing's going to be good tomorrow. You know, there's no need to be putting myself out there sometimes to rain quickly um, just because I can. Um, you know, the storm dictates what, and if I, there's no reason we've got poor visibility, we've got other pieces to be pushing and putting patrol in a little bit more of a hazardous situation. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more cautious. Um, as you can see from some of the stories I said, you know, I've close calls, um, unfortunately, but they've all, all formed me on how. I, I interact on me. Um, you know, there's a guy in that, that general manager in Canada, from uh, Canada that works at Craig and he wants us to open a piece of terrain like, like all the time. Like he wants people in there all the time. And so he wants open is the scariest to me. And uh, so I have to be sort of the reasons like, hey, let's wait a day or two. There's no push in it. So, you know, maybe yourself would have been way into keeping you know going for them but uh unfortunately i think you know two adages you do learn hopefully over time and uh you need to listen to the snow path and you don't need to go out there and be a go every single time um pay attention and on, on around you especially when you've got a persistent weak layer anybody else well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Appreciate it.